promise this morning, right? So I just want to review a few of the lines this morning from that song. It says, be enthroned over everything. You know, God wants us to put him first in every area of our lives, including our finances and our giving. Another line says, we lift our praise and you change the atmosphere. Man, so good. You know, did you know that giving is also worshiping? And just like when we worship and we lift our hands, we're saying, God, I surrender my life to you. And when we give, we're saying, God, I obey you and I surrender my trust to you to meet my finances because let's just face it, giving's a sacrifice. And finally, this is the best part. Our praise goes up, your rain comes down. When we worship, as the worship goes up, the blessings come down. And when we give, when we give back to God, it goes up, the blessings come down. Let's look at Luke 6:38 and it says this, "Give and you will receive." Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. There are three easy ways that you can give this morning at Mountain Movers. You can give cash or check as you exit this morning in the give back boxes. You can go online to mountainmovers.org or you can pull out your phone and use your app and give that way. And in fact, if you're going to give on your app this morning, or if not, pull out your phone anyway, and we'd like for you to check in this morning so that we know that you were here online or in person, because we want to know how we can celebrate with you this week or how we can pray for you. Let's pray this morning. Lord God, we just love you and thank you for who you are. And God, that your promises are so true. And God, that we're going to see the victories in our lives this morning. God, as we just continue to worship you in our giving and our truth in our life, God, that the blessings are going to come down. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Today we are in our series, Culture Canceled. This is going to be part four and the finale. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I know it's kind of been a hard series. Um, some of our life group leaders have appreciated that, I think, from us. Yeah, but They've been asking hey, us when we're going to be done. With that's the series, right. So. We bring you <laughs> what God brings us first, all right? Beat you up and send you But home. before we dive into this finale today, as we wrap up the series, we want to make you guys... Um, aware that next week we are going to do something very special. This September, Mountain River celebrated 14 years as a church. First Sunday in September. It doesn't seem like time has gone by so fast, but it really has. We've been here 14 years. We started in a little field 
with one couple that sit on the front row today still with us. And here we are 14 years later. So next Sunday, we are going to have a 14-year celebration. But here's the ticket, all right? We want the entire church to be able to be together for one service, and that can only happen at the amphitheater. So the weather is supposed to be beautiful next week. So next week, there will be one service. Say one service. One service. One service at 11 a.m. So all of you guys who are used to coming early, if you want to come, you come and hang out early. We're going to have breakfast food. We're going to have hot chocolate and coffee. Bring your lawn chairs. We're going to have a special guest. We've been trying to get BJ Jordan to come to Mountain Movers for a very long time, and he is going to be with us. He is with Crossroads Horse Ministry. He's going to be doing a presentation, and obviously that presentation can't take place on this stage. So invite all your friends. We're going to have a blast celebrating 14 years together, but it is 11 a.m. For all of you online family, don't freak out on me, okay? You will have the same service at 6 p.m. next Sunday night. So at 9.30, you won't have your normal live, but at 6 p.m., the same service that we have in the amphitheater, we will bring to you edited and live at 6 p.m. that night. That's right. Okay, so we're getting into part four. This is the final message in this series. After today, we're going to be done beating you up for a while. We're going to move <laughs> on to some, some, uh, some more uplifting uh, messages. We know it's been a little heavy, but you know what? Uh, good pastors preach the hard stuff that we don't want to hear, right. but the stuff that we need to hear. Right, amen. And I would, I would always uh, want to risk the chance of offending you than to be uh, known for um, making the, the gospel uh, shallow or sugar-coated, because right. it's not. And if I really love you as a pastor, as, as I do and Misty does, we're going to preach the hard things that we right. all don't want to hear, but the things that we really need to hear. So I yep. hope you appreciate that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard as we're, as we're moving in, into, we've been going through this, this series, Culture Canceled, and, you know, it's, we have to come to a place where we realize that it's really hard, it is hard, to live the Christian life in a culture that seems like it's having so much fun, yeah. right? It's difficult to look at culture around us and, and look at the things that they get to do, if you will, right. and think as a believer, if you call yourself a believer, then you think, man, look at all the fun I'm missing out on. And the yeah. truth is, let's just be honest, and the Word of God says this, sin is fun for a for season. For a season. It is right. fun, yep. but it's a temporary right. kind of fun. I've got to be honest with you. I can think back to times when I, when I was living in, in totally contrary to how God wanted me to live. And i got to admit, in the moment, it was fun, okay? It was fun, but it was only for a moment. Right. Eventually, there comes a moment, a time, yeah. where a price has to be paid yep. for the fun that you have. Because there's consequences that come with every decision. And the yeah. price, paying the price sometimes, many times, okay, let's be honest, all the time, when it comes to sin, yeah. right, or, or playing in the gray is extremely painful, yeah. right? It's painful. Why? Because disobedience leads to discipline, right? God disciplines those whom he what? Loves. Loves, Right? Same way we discipline our own children because we love them, not because we like dishing out punishment or consequences, but because we love them, we discipline in them, and in the same way, that's what God does with us. That's right. I, I would have great concern about you as a parent if I saw you not right. disciplining your child. Children need to be disciplined, right? Because we need to keep them on the straight and narrow. Sometimes, right. if you were a child like me, the wax sometimes builds up in your ears and you have a hard time hearing instructions. <laughs> and sometimes mom or dad needs to heat your rear end up so much that it melts the wax so that you can hear clearly. <laughs> right? It reminds me of, a, of a, an instance that happened a few weekends ago. It was so funny. Uh, we were at a volleyball game, uh, Blake and Mia, our girls play volleyball, and we were at a, at a tournament, and we were there with, uh, actually with, uh, with our, our sister-in-law, Jessie, and uh, many of you know her, and she has this little girl, uh, her and Nick, named Bree, and Bree is a cutie pie, but she is a stinking rascal at the same time. Look at this girl. I mean, she, yeah, she, is. she is full of sass. <laughs> And attitude and cuteness all in one bundle. <laughs> and Misty and I were sitting there on the bleachers, 
And Brie has this thing, we've been to many games with her, and Brie has this thing where she likes to wander a little bit, all right? And her mom, you know, lets her, you know, there's, there's boundaries, there's right, to this wandering. There's parameters to her wandering. But her, right before the next match started, her mom said, Brie, she said, do not cross that line. There's a line right there, the, the out-of-bounds line for the volleyball court. She said, do not cross that line. And you should have seen the look on this little girl's face. She put her hands behind her back and she was doing this. And you see what I'm doing? She's backing up. <laughs> you know where the line is? She's, she knows where the line is and she goes like this. She lifts. I'm not kidding you. This is hands true. behind her back. She's smiling at her mom and she lifts her leg. All while keeping eye contact with All her mom. She did not lose eye contact with her mom. Lifts her leg. <laughs> She should be a ballerina, because I'm gonna have a hard time doing this. She went back, and then she went, tap, 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 tapped the line. Three times. <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, this is, the, this is the defining moment for whether I'm gonna respect Jesse or not. <laughs> Jesse has long arms of love. She reached out, grabbed Bree, pow! <laughs> I mean, it, pow, she hit her ham hock and I, she, <laughs> that reverberated off the gym. She powed her so hard and she goes, she just kind of like shocked, like you, you struck me, like <laughs> what, what just happened? And I got to be honest with you on the inside, I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> yes. yes. It was the Nacho Libre. Yes. Well, I did, if you explained it correctly, her mom had told her, if you touch the line, she I'm going to bust your butt. <laughs> so we were thinking, you better bust her booty. Do you, you see what exactly, she's doing? Exactly. I left that yeah. part of the story. She did say, if you touch that line or cross the line, I'm going to bust your butt. Right. So and she really so kind of had she, to. So, wow. I mean, she got her good. And it was painful. I could tell by the look on Bree's face. <laughs> it was painful. But here's what's funny. We're laughing, but don't we do the same thing? Yeah, come on. It's like we, we want to see how close we yeah. can get. <laughs> without getting busted. Without getting busted. Yep. We want to see how close we can get to sin without losing our salvation. Mm. We want to see yeah. how much fun can I have without getting in trouble yeah. <laughs> by my heavenly father yeah. and getting papowed on my thigh. Yeah. Discipline. God disciplines those whom he loves and right. it hurts, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we test the parameters? Why do we do that? Why do we see how far away from pleasing God we can get to how close we can get to having fun without getting busted? Mm -hmm. Look at what, remember what Jesus said. We talked about this last week. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 19, he said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yeah. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So it's almost right. like, and we talked about this last week, but I want, I want to offer just a, a quick different perspective to maybe how I perceive it. I think Jesus was saying, let, let's put it this way. If, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ and the world or the culture that you're living in doesn't hate you, you're not doing it right. Right. Say that so again. Just, survey, just survey your circle of yeah. friends right now. And I just want to ask you, do you have any haters because of your witness for Jesus Christ? Right. If people, I asked this earlier in the series, I'm going to ask it again. If you were accused mm. of being a Christian, would there be any evidence to prove you guilty? Right. If I were to ask people that you work with, if so-and-so is a believer, would they scratch their head and say, you know, I don't know. They're a really nice person, but I don't know if they follow Christ or not. I'm just going to be, I'm going to go pastor mode. <laughs> That's a problem. Right. That's a problem. Yes. Well, I just don't believe 
that it, you know, we should just keep work separate, you know, from our, from our religion. We just really shouldn't intermix the two. Are you kidding me? Right. Like, Jesus is the air I breathe. That's right. And wherever I go, he is with right. me. And I have a mission because I'm breathing oxygen. Right. I have a mission while I'm here on this planet not to just go to work and make money, but to make Jesus famous. Yes. Right? Even if it means stirring up the water. I like stirring the waters. Right? <laughs> I want to stir the waters. I want people to know who Jesus is inside of me because I That's don't right. want them to go to hell. Yes. If I truly cared right. about the people I work with, then they would know that I'm a believer in the peace that I feel, the comfort that right. I experience, the strength that I have to go through the world's, the, the most difficult circumstances. It only right. is because of Jesus. Yeah. So I don't want to compromise or water down my faith when it comes to being around others. It's good. And we have to ask ourselves, are, are, are we living our faith in such a way that people hate us? The reality is they hated Jesus. The religious leaders of the day, right? The church of the day, right. they hated Jesus, right? Because right. he was stirring up the waters because right. he was not about settling for less than giving God our very, very best. And Jesus was not about religion. He was all about relationship and about pleasing and honoring God right. and about holy living. I love what Paul said in Romans 6, 15 through 16. I love this passage. Listen to this. He says, well, then, since, since God's grace has set us free from the law, how many of you guys are thankful for God's grace? Yes. You're thankful Amen. that you're forgiven and redeemed Amen. by the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. Since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Because you and I both know people that call themselves right. believers, but they don't look like believers. They don't, they don't talk like believers. They don't behave like believers. You and I know people that supposedly one day came to Christ, okay, and they, they believe that heaven is their home, right, but they're living like the devil, right? right. You and I know people that don't bear any fruit. Don't be that person. That's right. Listen to Paul's instruction. Listen to what Paul is saying. I want to read this again. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Right. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Listen right. to this Come very on. carefully. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to what? Separation. So you can say all day long, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you're still living in sin, yeah. it leads to what? Death. Death. You can't come to Christ and there be no life change. That's why our mission here at Mountain Movers Church is to lead people, ready, into a real, real. and life-changing life relationship. Not religion, relationship. Right. With Jesus, that is contagious, That's right? Right. Yes. There has to be a life change that follows the conversion. If you've come to Christ, if you've called on him to be Lord of your life, then, then the Lord sitting on the throne of your heart changes your thoughts, yes. which changes your actions, which changes your disciplines and your behaviors, the way you talk, the way you think, the right. way you act, the way you treat people. It changes the fruit on the tree. It changes right. everything, everything on the outside. So as believers, we can recognize other believers by the way we love each other yes. and by the fruit that's on the tree. That's right. So as believers, we have, to, we have to cling really hard to holiness yes. and stay away from the gray. As parents, we pray over our, our kids every single day. And one of the things that, that we always insert into that prayer over our kids is this. God, give them a hunger for holiness. Yes. Give them a hunger. That is a desire. I'm not right. talking about do what's right and not what's wrong. I'm not talking about religious right. rules. I'm saying give them yes. a hunger and a desire to be set apart from the things that yes. displease you, God. And give them a desire to want to cling to you far away from the gray. Yes. 
far away from those things that are just, you're just really not sure, but clinging to a life that wants to truly please God and make God proud. Give yeah. them a hunger for holiness, and that affects, God, what they think, yes. how they speak, how they treat other people. Amen. That prayer, it, 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 it's in our mind each and every day as we pray for them, and we're not gonna cease praying for them, and that's how we pray for you, that's right. is that God would give you a hunger for holiness. So stop walking the fence. Stop flirting with your flesh. Stop playing around with between the black and the white. You know, you walk the top of a fence and eventually you're going to slip and it's going to get you where the good Lord split you. (laughs) And trust me, trust me. You were one of those kids who did that, didn't you? Yes, I did many times. (laughs) Pain always, always accompanies compromise. Yes. As believers, we cannot compromise. Pain always accompanies yes. compromise. Stay out of the gray. That's right. So last week we talked about that. We talked about staying away from the gray. And today we want to get really, really practical as we're wrapping up this series because we want for you what we want for our own kids. Like a lot of you, you're older than us. A lot of you are younger than us. But we think of you the same way. And that is the very prayer that Brad said we pray over our kids. When they were younger, we made things very black and white, right? We used to live right out here um, next to, the I mean, on this property next to the church. That's where we started. And I remember very vividly having four children under the age of two and a half. Okay, that's, our kids are all within two and a half years. And I was terrified when we moved here because I was afraid of that road. I was really afraid that our kids would get a little squirrely on us and they would get like pancaked. Like I saw like, what was the little, um, what was the cartoon that always got flattened? Seriously, Roadrunner. Coyote. Was it the coyote? Okay, whatever. Anyway, so when we moved here, we put up a six foot high fence in the backyard like we had a prison, okay? And we would tell our kids, you're not allowed in the front yard that was black and white. There was no fence in the front yard. You're only allowed to play in the backyard where there was a fence. Then as they got a little bit older and they began to understand the parameters of where they could be, they could then come out to the front yard, but it was like never, ever, ever go out towards the road, never. Well, there was this one time where it was getting close to Halloween, probably it was probably July, but in our home, like they thought they had costumes, they should wear them anytime. So Tyler had this Spider-Man costume and he put it on and he had been out front in right in the front yard. I could see him right out the window in the kitchen where I was doing dishes and all of a sudden he disappears. And I glanced because I had to like really move to be able to see out the window to see where he was. And all of a sudden I realized that Ty is in the middle of the road, okay? Ty is out there on this highway. And if you're ever around here, you know how fast people go. Slow down, like, oh my gosh. So I come running out of the house, screaming at Brad, screaming at Ty, like get out of the road. And about that time, this car is coming, slows all the way down and stops. I feel like, total epic failure of a parent, right? It's not a dog. It's a child. He's like five years old. He's on the highway. Of course, I grab him up. I beat his rear end right there for the whole world to see to make sure everybody knew he was being disciplined. We took him back in. That was the last time any of them ever played in the road. We made it black and white. And if you get into the black, if you go against what mom and dad said, there's going to be consequences. Why? We didn't want him killed. That day, God honestly saved his life. But here's what I want you to understand, is that you need as a believer, as a baby believer, God says, hey, there's things that are black and white. Then the closer you get to me, I want you to fear me. And the more you have awe for me, the closer you get to me, those areas you're not really sure, I'm gonna help you to understand how to stay away from those. So today, very practically, we're going to give you five things. This is part four. Right now, I would suggest you take out a phone or a notepad and you take some notes because this right here, if you apply it, will save you some pain down the road. This is part four. How do I do the right 
thing. That's what we're calling this. These are five questions. How do I do the right thing? Who would agree you want to do the right thing? Okay, I don't know about the rest of you. Gosh, we suck as pastors. No, just kidding. Okay, how do I do the right thing? Number one, question you have to ask. Does the Bible say it's sin? This is where the black and white lines come in. Does the Bible say it's sin? I, do we have a trooper in the house? I think we do. Let me ask Pastor Grant a question. Pastor Grant, if I'm driving in Missouri on one of the roads, and regardless of whether I know the speed limit, if I'm driving 90 and I have no idea what the speed limit is, am I still getting a ticket if you stop me? Yes. Yes. Yes, and that's the laws of the land. Here's what I want you to understand. You can say to yourself, I didn't know that was sin. I just, I just didn't know. And I told a cop that before. I didn't know what the speed limit was. And he said, young lady, it is your responsibility when you pull out on a road to know the speed limit. And you will be held accountable for driving that speed or you will pay a ticket, yeah, I remember which I, I paid. That day. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> he said it just like that. <laughs> the fact is, it's the same thing with the Word of God. We have a Bible. You can look it up. You can ask your life group leader. You can ask a pastor. You can ask a team lead. Ask somebody to help you look it up in the Bible. Is it sin? If it is, get as far away from it as possible possible. Don't play around with sin. You will get burned. There are consequences. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 says this, do not let sin control the way you live. Brad said it earlier, same chapter. When whatever you get into over and over and over, you become a slave to it, whether you want to or not. Romans 12, last week we read it, it says this, don't follow the customs and behaviors of the people in this world. Don't follow what everybody else is doing. I guarantee you they're going to lead you astray. Do you hear me? You can't look at what everybody else is doing and say, they're all doing it. The question you have to ask is, what does God's word have to say about it? This is your guide. It goes on to say, verse 12, do not give in to your sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to sin. Paul was constantly talking about sexual sin because in that day, and just like this day, it was so prevalent. He said, don't let your body be an instrument of evil to sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God who you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. So the first question you have to ask is, does the Bible say it's sin? It's pretty easy. Number two is this. Could it cause someone else to stumble into sin? Okay, last week we talked about this a lot. If you're thinking about doing something, it's not black and white. Bible doesn't really say it's sin. I mean, it's kind of like Brie. I can get right over here next to it. Bible doesn't really say. I mean, is it that big of a deal if I have a drink? Is it that big of a deal? If I, you know, if I gamble, is it that big of a deal? If I watch pornography, is it that big of a deal? I can go on all day. Is it that big of a deal what I wear? I don't know. Do you have any teenagers? Do you care what they wear? I do. I have boys and girls. <clears throat> I do. I care. Why? Because I love them. The question you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, is will it cause anybody else to stumble into sin? Brad gave you the illustration last week. If he and I go to the bar and we have a drink, no desire to, but if we did, what would that say to everybody else there? It, they what would say it's okay. What could it cause in someone else's life? They would say if pastors are doing it, <laughs> then I can do it. We have to protect our witness. We have to, you know, honestly, if, we, if you get anything out of today's message in this series, all right, it, I want you to get two things. And that is, number one, ask yourself, what can I do? It's, instead of saying, what, what can I not do? <laughs> Say, what can I do to make right. God proud of me? Yes, amen. To please God. 
And secondly, how can I guard and protect my witness right. and guard and protect others who are trying to learn how to live for God? Right. Somebody came up to us on the sidewalk a couple weeks ago and tried to stump us with one. And they said, okay, well then, um, if I'm in a restaurant and there's somebody that struggles with gluttony and I'm eating in front of them, then I'm causing them to sin, right? Let this soak in. Gluttony is a sin, okay? Overindulging right. Right. in food is a sin. It's yep. not preached on very much because a lot of pastors are overweight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it is a sin. Well. It's all about self-control. I'm kidding. I mean, I am, and I'm not. I mean, it's, it is. That is true. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> it is a sin. Overindulgence is a sin. That's right. Addiction of any sort because... It becomes idolatry. Yes, it's idolatry. You're clinging right. to that more than you are to God. To God. Right. So you know what my response was to that? Yeah. If I, yeah. If I am mentally aware that I'm in the room with somebody that struggles with a food addiction and, and, there's some, and in some way, shape, or form, right. by me eating in front of them, They're that I'm stumble. causing them to somehow stumble, right. then yes, I would push away from my plate and I would not eat in front of them. That's not radical. Let's look at it this way. Many of you guys, we fast as a church a lot every month. There's many times during the fast, you know, where one might be fasting and the other is not, okay? If, if I knew that you were fasting from food and you're really struggling, like you're having a really hard time with it and you're experiencing, right. you know, just this pressure and this temptation, this heaviness, am I gonna sit down and eat, you know, this big steak right in front of you? If I know that you're fasting, no. no not I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna <laughs> cause you to stumble and to give in and break your fast right. because you're, you're so hungry in that moment. Right. Now, would I, I, if I were to ask myself the question, is it a sin? Stop asking that right. question. You're thought. asking the wrong question. It right. doesn't matter if it's a sin. What matters right. is do you love others? Do right. you care about other people enough right. that you will do whatever you have to do with your own lifestyle, right. your own behavior, your own actions, that you're willing to do whatever it takes right. to prevent someone else from stumbling right. and falling short? We have a scripture that accompanies so in this. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10, you can go and you can read this whole dialogue. But the Apostle Paul is really dealing with this in the church there. And they were struggling with whether or not they were to eat the meat because most of the meat in the market had been actually sacrificed to idols. So some believers were saying, we can't eat that meat. It's been sacrificed to idols. While other believers were saying, but wait a second, idols aren't even real. There's only one true God. So in essence, there's really not any other gods. So it's okay for us to eat the meat. So Paul was going back and forth dealing with the believers in the church he had planted. And this is what he told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. It says this, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Verse 24, I want you to catch this. But don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And you'll have to go and study these three passages. I don't have time to teach it all. But what he was basically, in essence, saying is, out of your love for someone else, you should be willing to say, if that's going to cause someone else to stumble, I'm not gonna I will refrain. I will stay as far away from that as possible. Why? Out of my love for someone else. The next part he goes on to talk about, and I want you to see this. Actually, let me hit Matthew 18, 6. We read this last week, but it says this. If you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, check this out. God is serious. It would be better for you to put a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That used to scare the crap out of me when I was a child. I read that. I'm like, holy cow. But listen to God how intense serious. and serious he is very God serious. is about this. Verse 7, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable. He's saying temptation in this block. world is inevitable. It's going to happen. But what sorrow awaits the person who does 
the tempting. You may say, I don't have a problem with that. I can, I can dabble in that. No it's big deal. About you. But the next person might not be able to, and they're going to stumble and fall. Question number three is simply this. Does it affect your testimony to unbelievers? Brad mm. said it very clearly. If you were convicted, if you were put on the stage today and you were asked, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a follower of Christ? Is there enough? Do, do people around you know that you're a believer? The fact is, in this same passage in 1 Corinthians, the next thing that Paul was dealing with is this. There were temples there, and they were worshiping idols, and they would sacrifice meat, and then they would throw these big parties. And some of the believers would go, and they literally were saying, like, the Bible doesn't say that it's sin, so why can't we do this? And here was the question. Let me explain exactly what was happening. They would go to the temple, okay? This was not church. This was not worshiping the one true God. These were idols, okay? These were temples for false gods. They would go there. They would sacrifice meat. Then they would have a celebration. They would bring the meat out ready to serve the people, and they would bring lots and lots of alcohol with it, okay? Following the alcohol, once people had, had drank enough to be intoxicated, then the temple prostitutes were brought in to the temple. Now, you can just go ahead and you can just understand what is going on at this party. And Paul was saying, what are you doing there? And they said, is it sin? And he was trying to help them to understand. First of all, can you eat the meat sacrificed to an idol? Look, and he makes it very clear. You can have the meat if you want to, but if it's going to cause somebody else to stumble, don't do it. But why do you want to go? Why do you want to go to the temple when you know what's following the meat right. is all the alcohol followed by the prostitutes? Well, I'm not, I'm not even going to drink. I'm not participating drink, in and that. I'm not going to be with a prostitute. But his question went deeper. He said, but Why? Would you want to put yourself in that situation? Where your good can be evil spoken of. Exactly. You might not be participating. I talked to a person the other day and they said, I can go to the parties. I can go to the parties. I'm not going to drink. But then at the parties, people said, oh, you're not going to drink. And she said, I can drink if I want to. I can drink. And I said, girlfriend... You need to get your butt out of the party. Because if you keep going back to the party, telling yourself you're not going to drink, it's not going to be very long, and it's going to lead you right in to the drinking. And if you're there thinking you're witnessing to other people around you, let me just tell you what the world is doing. They're just waiting to see you fall. They're, wait they're waiting and they're watching. They are waiting and they are watching to, to catch a believer who misery says loves company. they're a Christian. They're just waiting for the moment, just waiting for the moment when a follower of Jesus slips up and falls. And is there grace? Of course. But your witness is tarnished. So stay as far away as possible. That's good. Question number four as we're wrapping up today. Do you feel bad when or after you participate? Or before. Or before. Here's what you need to understand. God is three in one, okay? It's called the Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each has a different role in the Godhead. The Holy Spirit's role in our life is to bring conviction. Jesus himself, when he left, his disciples were so devastated that he was about to go away. And he said, I need to go away so that the comforter, the guide, can come. I want to read this passage to you. In John chapter 16, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says this, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, will not come. But if I go, I'm going to send back to you the Holy Spirit. Now check this out. Verse 8. Here's his job. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. The entire role of the Holy Spirit is that 
that inner voice. He lives on the inside of you if you've accepted Jesus into your heart. And he's the one that is saying, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, don't get so close to that line. Don't do it. Uh Uh-uh, don't do it. Or then if you do it, he's the one that's saying, why'd you do that? Or he's the one who's saying, buy that lady's gas at the gas pump. You see that single mom, buy her fuel. And you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Buy her fuel. One time I'll never forget. Don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Just save it. When you've been I'm doing ministry time. for 20 years, you know what you they're You know thinking. what's, I, I want to time. Just don't do it. But it's the role of the Holy Spirit to guide us. So guess what? <laughs> the closer you get to Jesus, the more you listen to the voice, the more you just know. The more you just know what would please him, what would displease him. It's just like a parent and a child. If your kids have lived with you very long, it doesn't take them long to know what would make mom and dad proud or what would disappoint them. And today as we wrap up this series, you know, our heart and our, our heart cry for you in the church is that each and every one of you would come into full alignment with God's purpose for your creation. Why he literally formed you in your mother's womb. And the enemy's purpose is to drag you as far away from that as possible. If he can get you to live in the gray, Mm -hmm. if he can get you to stay as far away from holiness as possible, maybe you slide into heaven, but he keeps you from your true purpose here on earth. So as we conclude today, remember, Jesus is coming back. He is coming back very, very soon. And he's coming back for a spotless bride. That's right, yes. He's coming back for a church that is set apart from the culture. Yeah. And a church that's hungry for holiness. A church that's hungry to want to please God and make God proud with their attitude, their thinking, their words, their actions. I want to conclude with Ephesians 5 and 1. He said, imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do, because you are his dear children. Verse 15 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Let's pray today. Father, God, we're so grateful for your word, even when it's hard to swallow, even when it makes us uncomfortable, even when it makes us squirm in our seats, God, even when it's convicting, we're thankful. God, because you've called us as your church, You've called us to be holy. You've called us to be set apart. You've called us to be loyal, God, to your word and to your ways. Help us, Lord, as believers to to stay close to you and to the things that please you and not to wander off to those parameters, God, into those gray areas where we risk falling into temptation and sin ourselves, where we risk jeopardizing our witness to others who don't know you, where we risk becoming a stumbling block for younger believers who are, who are less mature in their faith. God, time is so short. And I just pray that as the church, you would... Really, God, just breathe. Breathe into our spirits, God. (laughs) The reality of the the time and how it's so short. Breathe within us the reality, God, 
of how we are to live so that we will not only be ready for your soon coming return, God, but that we would have a strong, God-fearing witness before others. That we would, instead of causing others to think, well, maybe I can do that, God, that we would actually inspire people by our holy living, that they would see that we're set apart, see that we're clinging to God and that we have a hope that they don't have by the fruit that's on our trees, the lives that we live. God, help us to inspire those on the outside looking in that they would want what we have. Give us more conviction. Give us more of the drawing of your spirit that speaks to our hearts in those moments and says, what are you doing? You're better than this. You were called for greater things than this. Give us your Holy Spirit. I pray over every person in this room right now, God. I pray over every person watching online, and I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would flood our hearts with God-fearing, holy conviction that we would see ourselves in the mirror the way you see us, that we would see our reflection with yours and that we would compare the difference and we would see the areas, God, where we need to change. The areas of our lives, God, those dark places that we need to shed the light of your love and your grace into those areas, God, of repentance to say, I am done. I am done. I am done with this behavior. I'm done going back to this thing like a dog returns to its vomit. I'm done. God, I'm calling out in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus Christ today, God, that, that addictions, behaviors, attitudes, actions, words that are dwelling in the gray areas, God, I pray that they would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. God, I see so many people in my spirit right now, God, that are living in the gray. And I pray right now in Jesus' name, God, According to your word, you said, you said that we are not, God, to be lukewarm. Hot or cold, yes, but not lukewarm. I will spew you out of my mouth. Help us, God, to be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Not living in the gray. Help us to be holy. Help us to be that church that you're coming back for, that spotless bride that's ready for the groom. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, I want to ask you, are you right with God? Do you have a real relationship with him? Are you living a life that pleases him? He loves you so much. He wants to save you by his grace, by the blood of Jesus. He wants to wash you and make you clean and make you as white as snow. If that's you today and you need to make this decision, would you right now in your heart just ask God to forgive you of your sins and just tell God, say, Lord, I believe you that, that, that you are who you say you are, that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And I confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, if you made that decision, will you just raise your hand so I know who you are? Thank you. Anybody else today? You made that decision. For those of you that are watching online, if you made that decision, will you type in the comment section? All in to let us know that you made that life-changing decision today. Let me pray for those of you that made that decision. Father, I thank you, Lord, for those that have accepted you, for those that have turned, God, from their sins to cling to you, God. I thank you, God, that heaven is their home. I thank you, God, that you are changing them from the inside out for your glory and your goodness. In Jesus' name, everybody said
Amen, 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 amen. If you just prayed that prayer and received Jesus in your heart, we just want to say that is the best decision you will ever make. We want to encourage you guys to text Life Change to 844-MMC next, and that will give you a message from Brad and I that will help you on your next steps. Now, next week, I want to just remind you that this week we are on a midweek break for life groups. So there will not be life groups, Accelerate, Kidsplosion. We're on a break as we prepare for our 14-year celebration next Sunday. So grab a friend, invite them to come to church. It's going to be outdoors. It's going to be beautiful. One service, 11 a.m. We'll see you then. Have a great day. Love you guys. Have a great week.